Hello, my name is Jordan Fleary. I work in Bloomberg's Human Resources Department and I'm the outgoing co-chair of our London Black Professional Community. Open, candid conversations about race in our society and workplace must continue in order to build empathy and understanding and support the fight for racial equality. Thankfully, these conversations have recently been taking place across our firm. I'm pleased to welcome you today to episode two of our Conversations About Race, brought to you by the Black Professional and Pan-Asian communities here in London in partnership with Diversity and Inclusion. It's been quite a couple of months for the Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities in the UK and around the world. We're all aware of the murder of George Floyd on the 25th of May that shocked the world. This landed on a community that was already trying to process the report suggesting that COVID was killing Black and Asian people in disproportionate numbers. Indeed, on the 2nd of June, Public Health England released a report that showed all-cause mortality was four times higher than expected for black males, three times higher in Asian males, whilst only two times higher in white males. The numbers were only slightly lower for black and Asian females. The recommendations, however, were not released along with the report. So it's no surprise if our mental health has been tested when we wake every morning to news stories telling us we are 10 times more likely to be stopped by the police five times more likely to have force used against us, twice as likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act. And if you survive the police, you're four times more likely to die of COVID. Whilst all of these reports, news stories and images are impossible to avoid, for some, work becomes a place of retreat. For others, it may be difficult to compartmentalize and to focus on work. It has been a challenge, an honor, and a privilege to co-lead our black professional community through these troubled times. I've spoken to community members that have been very happy with the support and understanding they've received from their team leader and colleagues. Others perhaps wish they'd had more support. I know many people find it difficult to talk about race or don't know how to approach the conversation, which often puts the onus on us, the black and Asian community, to explain what racism is how it still exists, how it affects us personally all over again. This can be tiring. Indeed, this can be exhausting. So I'm excited to introduce Jamila Noel, my successor as co-lead of the Black Professional Community and team leader in our enterprise data business, who I know is going to do wonderful things as she continues to support the community going forwards. Thank you, Jordan. I too am excited to pick up where you've left off and to continue to drive forward the important and difficult conversations that we know need to be had. Today is an opportunity for us to really go beyond the data and to reflect on the impact the past couple of months have had on us and look forward to how we can improve the world that we live in. The data is confronting. Inequalities ranging from health and social care, housing, pay and a lack of diversity in leadership roles are putting pressure on politicians and companies to tackle these gaping holes. The data highlights that the divide is a large one to address. The killing of George Floyd and COVID-19 have forced us to confront these disparities and consider the impacts and steps forward and steps forward to a sharper with a sharper and more urgent focus. We have two incredible guest speakers today, and I'm looking forward to hearing their reflections on how each and every one of us here today can become a part of the solution. So a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. If we lose connection, please stay with us. We will be back. If you have questions for the panel, please IB Jordan Fleury, and we will address as many questions as time allows during the Q&A at the end. And with that, we're eager to hand over to eager to hand over to Zoe Schneeweiss, Senior Economics Editor for Bloomberg News, who will introduce our guests and will be moderating today's discussion. Over to you, Zoe. Good morning. I'd like to introduce my guests. As, um, we've got two illustrious guests, as Jamila just mentioned. I'll start off with Patrick. Patrick Vernon is a cultural historian and founder of Every Generation, 
and the 100 Great Black Britons campaign, which develops education programs, publications and films on cultural heritage and family history. Over the past decade, Patrick's been in the forefront of several high profile campaigns on cultural heritage and social justice in the UK. Most of us will know him from the campaign for the amnesty of the Windrush gener generation, which led to a government U-turn on immigration policy. Patrick, Patrick is patron of ACCI, a long-established black mental health charity in Wolverhampton, and Patrick, uh, and patron of Santé, a social enterprise in Camden, which supports and befriends refugees and asylum seekers across London. Our second speaker is Ade Adeyemi, who currently works for NHS England and NHS Improvement and sits on the executive committee of the NHS BME Network. He's also director of the Chatham House African Public Health Leaders Fellowship, which supports policy development work and with developing countries across Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia. Um, Looking at the data, we've already uh, had some numbers now. Um, Patrick, what does, from your perspective, what do you, what does the, when you look at the data released, what does it mean? What do you understand from it? Uh, obviously, we're still looking at the data, but um, my background, I've worked in health and social care for many years. And it's ironic because I, about 16 years ago, I worked for the NHS as, as a director. I was in charge of what was called the Health Action Zone, which was looking at attacking health inequalities. Um, there were about 26 health action zones in the country looking at health inequalities, diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, the, inter the interface between health and social care, relationship between planning, working with the communities, etc. And sadly, um, when I looked at the data around COVID-19 and the whole strategies over the last 15 years around health inequalities, we haven't really gone that further, to be quite honest. It's, it's further highlighted the current health inequalities that we've known for the last 25, 30 plus years. Um, around the disproportionality. I mean, obviously, the, 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 the impact of COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on BME communities um, in terms of not simply just having uh, the, the, the uh, capturing the virus, but also the, the level of deaths and impacts on community, as well as the impacts of um, social distancing policy, which is a major impact on people's mental health and well-being. This double whammy is really a major health catastrophe, which unfortunately the government's taken a grip on. And the very fact that the public health report, which was eventually, the full reports were eventually released, there's nothing, there's nothing in there. Um, you could you could actually delete the dates. And I could tell you that would be no different to reports I've seen in 2012, 10, 2005. Uh, etc. So I think uh, even the eighth report, which came out in 1998. So there's no, you know, so that's the challenge that we've got. The question is about action, prioritisation and accountability. Okay, um, Ali, do you agree with that? Or what was surprising for the data with you, for you? Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, <clears throat> really interesting to be here. My first reaction is to think about actually the uh, impartiality of data and the fact that there isn't, uh, you know, data is never completely objective. And, you know, Patrick is right, this is data that we've uh, seen before. Um, and actually, you know, he's right also that the, that the data isn't completely complete yet. Uh, we know, for example, that the face masks that people wear, there's, 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 there's a new clinical trial going on to try and get more information about that because, you know, the masks are normally built for uh, six foot, uh, you know, white men in construction industries. So we need to collect data about how it fits different gender, different racial types, etc. Um, and just one interesting uh, thought that came to mind actually as, as we were speaking was, if I if if you were to ask the question of who you think uh, is a better footballer, uh, Messi or Ronaldo, you know, you could use data in whichever way you wanted to uh, to make your argument. But also, actually, the way that the data is structured reflects your view of the game. So, for example, we collect, um, or you know, the, the, the statisticians collect shots on target, shots on goal, distance covered, but it isn't nuanced enough to measure and track, for example, when a player moves around on a pitch and they take other players with them, they open up positions on the game. That isn't a metric that's calculated because no one believes, or, or fewer people believe that's an important thing to collect. So the point I'm trying to make is that 
the data that we collect right now to tell us about healthcare workers, tell us about the health system, reflects the power structures that are already there. And so, you know, I think the objectivity we need to increase now is to collect different nuances of data that allow us to tell them a, a, a richer picture. So what what then should be changed, Adi? What do you think needs to be adjusted to get the, to get data that's more reflective of what the actual situation? Uh, so take, for example, in, in, in healthcare delivery, most of the programs you see on the front line in healthcare hospitals and trusts are the outcomes of a design in an organization like NHS England, NHS Improvement. So what you could have, for example, and what I don't think is collected at the moment, is take a, a cancer program or a mental health program or you know, a diabetes program. Um, what was the diversity of representation on the design of those programs? When people said, actually, we should structure our healthcare clinics like this or like that, or ward manage, or you know, we should have, or, or, or maybe they didn't even think to have clinical risk assessments for you know, coronavirus uh, staff members, was that because the people designing the interventions, designing the programs, weren't that diverse? So we don't collect that information. We don't kind of have that level of nuance to then understand the outcomes in the healthcare delivery that we see later down the uh, pipeline. Now, Patrick, you mentioned that this report could have been from 1998. Uh, so in a way, these are inherent um, problems. These are inherent um, issues with collecting data. Um, what, what do you think needs to change? Well, I think building upon what Ade talked about, it, the data is based on subjectivity. Uh, it's and also a lot of the data is based on the kind of social class model, the ABC one. It's only recently that they've started to factor more stuff around the health needs of beaming communities, and and that's why we need to have more intelligence and more nuance of that. But you know, we know already what works, believe it or not. Um, you know, all of you that uh, on this call you probably have clear ideas what works in your business practice and then how to convince your senior partner that this that my idea is better than your idea. And that's where we're at at this present moment of time uh, in this situation, that there are some clear uh, there are some clear examples that can work. Uh, one of the key things for this whole pandemic, which has never happened or didn't really happen in many ways, was um, so proper messaging reflecting the cultural diversity needs of the community. There was no, you know, the mixed messages anyway. Uh, but there's clear research work and evidence work on social marketing, what works for communities and how they receive information and how they don't receive information. And not, not, that's, not, that's not being considered. But I think ultimately one of the key issues from the PPE stuff that they identified is um, not just simply about the, type, the right type of PPE, but how it was deployed and when was it deployed. And, the, and there's lots of there's lots of um, data coming from the whole range of professional bodies and 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 uh, on, on organisation representing BME academic uh, BME nurses and doctors and other clinicians and been discussed over the last few months of very soon calls that people were reassigned to COVID wards or COVID duty without the proper support and equipment as well. And also, the, the, we've, it's almost just like now we've started community testing for the test and trace service which, uh, as well. And so there's still more work needs to be done. But I think the biggest issue I have is the government has treated the BME community with contempt, as they're putting it mildly. Um, the very fact that for two main reasons, even, af even after lobbying for this review, um, there's still no government guidelines, recommendations, or, or a focus of attention uh, around this issue, around the high levels of deaths within the BME community. Never least, uh, you know, that's the, that's the first thing. I'm, in, I'm part of a, a, a network of campaigners and organisations campaigning for a public independent inquiry. Actually, there are about five different organisations now demanding for independent inquiry. Um, the minister, prime minister, only last week agreed that there should be one, but we don't know the scale, time scales, the terms of reference, who's going to be involved in that. So there will be a public inquiry. And one of the reasons why everyone's demanding a public inquiry, which goes back to your question about data, is there is lack of confidence and trust in how the data has been interpreted, um, disseminate, disseminated, and used by the government. And the only way we will have a clarity 
is a public inquiry, judge-led, which we can look at the facts and figures better. And also, a lot of people have died. Don't forget, officially, it's been about 40,000, but unofficially, you may be as high as 60,000 people have died in Britain. You know, it's you know compared to water. If you put this in the wartime context, this is major, and you know, and there, you know, so I think lots of people are asking lots of answers uh, regarding not just the data, but how the government has used the data to protect the community. Speaking of, when you now don't you mention deaths, um, I was um, the reports also mention um, the, the look at the death rates among NHS. Uh, um, staff that of Black or Asian heritage, um, that also seems to be overproportional. Is that because there are more Black and Asian workers in the front line? Or how would you interpret that, um, Adi? Uh, yeah, so again, I, I think speaking to the uh, structural way that data is collected, I think you'll find that, yes, there are, you know, uh, it, it's not a very clear picture. Um, but actually, if you go to kind of the roots of the issue, and the way that data is collected, you look at the, um, I, I, I think the investigation or, or the answer lies around the way death certificates and the way death is recorded. Um, and I think we're again, finding out more interesting pictures about the way Public Health England categorise what are coronavirus deaths or what are not coronavirus deaths. And there's a difference between the um, devolved nations, administrations rather, so Scotland, their death certificates are structured or they use that information differently to the way that uh you know the england does so um you know again the objectivity and the bias and the way that people construct data to then tell a picture i think gives us the answer here that actually the inequalities that we see in um the levels of representation in the decision making groups and forums of government of authorities then reflects in the way that data is interpreted then reflects in the way that data is constructed then reflects in the way that we understand the world that we live in um, and um, Ada, from speaking earlier, I believe you also support a public inquiry into this. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know, very welcome that that, that the prime minister you know acknowledges that that that, that one is needed. Um, I think you know the 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 devil in the detail now will be as as Patrick alludes to the terms of reference. You would hope that there'll be a strong section to investigate the uh, you know uh, impact on 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 Bain populations. Um, and then also you would hope that one, you know, an investigation could be timely. You think of other inquiries where perhaps it's, you know, taken a few years to happen and then the government is no longer in power and, you know, being able to kind of hold people to account and and, and actually get some answers and, uh, you know, is, is, is difficult. But you see the way that independent public inquiries have worked in the policing uh, force, in social services, uh, excuse me, the way to um, tackle systemic uh, challenges, I think, is to have, you know, the strongest levers of government investigating and, and finding the truth. Um, Patrick, um, Ado has already now um, spoken of the uh, timeline here. We know that public inquiries do take some time. If you have any dates, what would you, what kind of timeline would you envision? What do you think should be happening? Uh, like now, basically. <laughs> Um, obviously, I mean, obviously it's difficult because it looks like we're going to prepare ourselves for a second pandemic. But I think, the, I mean, the government's already announced a commission looking at racial inequality already. So, if the, And there have been other commissions and other bod announcements made by the government over the last few weeks. So the government, it's in a gift. They can actually announce a public inquiry now. They can actually get... Then they can actually work with stakeholders to identify who could be in that panel, uh, that inquiry, with, uh, public inquiry, uh, and, accept, and and we could do it now. We could set it up right now, so it's it works in live real time, and not work historically. Because um, and, and one of the reasons why a public inquiry is important, again, you know, over forty odd thousand people have died uh, in Britain. A lot of frontline staff have died. And you know, I've you know, I've lost a family member to COVID nineteen, and everyone wants an opportunity to share their experiences and the impact of COVID nineteen. So if people have lost if, if, if uh, someone's died on the front line, working with NHS or transport or retail, or someone's died in a care home, family members, co-workers, professional bodies, and organisations want 
the opportunity to share these experiences like now, not two years later, like now. I think this is really, really important. Um, I've set up a fund with an organisation we call Yabele, called the Majonzi Fund, uh, because one of the impacts of um, COVID-19 is a whole stuff around social distancing. My brother-in-law died three months ago. My sister decided not to um, have a funeral because uh, my parents were shielding in the Midlands. And the whole family were all, all scattered in different parts of the country. So because of the policy at the time, only six people could assemble at a funeral. She's decided not to go ahead with that. So, but she, she's, her plan is to have a burial later, a uh, funeral, you know, um, cremation uh, later, uh, and then have an event. But and there's thousands of families, beaming families all around the country who have not allowed to practice their faith, their cultural norms and traditions, and have an opportunity to say goodbye to their loved ones. So I've launched this fund, the Majonzi Fund, M-A-J-O-N-Z-I, GoFundMe, it's on GoFundMe. Uh, Majonzi, the Swahili word means deep or deep, deep, grief or deep sorrow. And so the idea is to help, is to give out small grants to people to organise events, say goodbye to loved ones. So it'd be really great for to have support on that. But I think the sentiment behind that is that a lot of people uh, are, will be has experiencing or have experienced post-traumatic stress because of the lockdown and the, I'm, I'm coupled with a bereavement is a double whammy. So part of closure for the whole community and for society is a public inquiry. For the government to not take it seriously or to have a, a watered down version is not good enough. It took 30 years for the families at Hillsborough to fight for justice. We don't want to wait 30 years, we want it now. So Patrick, um, Pat, um, Patrick's now mentioned um, sort of the mental health issue here. Are you expecting that to uh, crop up more commonly now, are they? Um, that people have not been able to say goodbye and that that will uh, um, impact negatively on their mental health? Yeah, you would, you, you, you would hope so. I um, harbour a little bit of scepticism just because you look at the way mental health services uh, unfortunately lag behind, uh, you know, acute care, uh, social care, you know, there is an imbalance, unfortunately, across um, much of the health service, although that is improving of late. Um, but, but but you're right, there is an, an interesting element here, which is that people want the opportunity to make sense of what's happened. And, uh, you know, we saw in, in other inquiries that the ability to kind of talk to a, you know, a, a forum like that and submit your evidence and, and, and say, this is what I know to be true, this is what I felt, There'll be uh, clinicians on wards who, who have stories to tell, and they've had perhaps nowhere, you know, of importance they feel to be able to kind of air those views. Um, so it, it's absolutely vital for the mental health of, of individuals, of, of the NHS, and actually of, you know, I, I think the country as a, as, a, as a whole, to have a sense-making forum or event to, you know, come, you know, work through what we've um what we've been through and then we don't just need an inquiry you obviously want action afterwards as well how do you think it'll be part it'll be possible to hold um the government and institutions responsible and hold them accountable for what's happened and to make sure things improve well thankfully there are um, a number of organizations or kind of uh frameworks arising to kind of give that uh you know for that to happen, so there is what we uh, what, what what NHS is calling the Race and Health Observatory, which has been set up by Lord Victor de Bawale in uh, one of the arms and bodies of the NHS, the NHS Confederation. So that will be an independent uh, observatory and body that can be able to speak to what I spoke to earlier, actually, which is about the program design. So they will look at big initiatives, programs, policies coming out from uh, NHS England, NHS Improvement, the NHS Family or NHS Trust. And, you know, kind of be, 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 be a bit of an excuse remover, submit the evidence and say this is actually, you know, not good enough or this needs to be improved. Um, you know, you can, I mean, sometimes when you really think conceptually and theoretically about what it means to hold people to account, um, sometimes it's about bringing to the fore, bringing to the, to the light, the truth of a matter. And if there's, you know, for want of a better word, public shame or kind of, accountability and uprising about something and hopefully that can shift attitudes shift behaviors 
because this is definitely a uh, you know a, a a we problem. It's not something that just one group of society, as in i.e., Bain people, should fix. "Quote unquote," it's something that we all should try and address. Um, and so you you know there are institutions coming up like this, but we would hope to see more. Not you know not just one organisation or one body doing it, but individual people all all kind of asking for the same thing. So, um, Patrick, you obviously have a track record of successful campaigns and, and instituting government change and government rethinking policy. policy. Um, what are you trying this? What are you doing this time? Well, I, I'm, well so I'm supporting the campaign for public inquiry. So I'm working with a whole range of organisations, individuals, health professionals uh, and families who have lost loved ones like I have. For that as well, and honestly, that's you know until the government decides when it's going to look like we'll still campaign until then. But also, um, it's not just the public inquiry. Each uh, NHS organisation and body will be conducting its own reviews as well. So it's making sure that there are reviews of services. Uh, or well, I mean, touching the whole stuff around, for example, uh, mental health services. That is quite right. The current mental health services in this country is not fit for purpose to meet the needs of BME communities, basically. It's a very narrow prescriptive model of counselling uh, and psychotherapy intervention doesn't really take into account the needs. And uh, and there's not a, <clears throat> there's no national offer for bereavement support for BME communities. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm working with a number of BME-led uh, therapist organisations who are talking to the mainstream organisations, how you can <clears throat> extend that offer. And, and I think that's really important. I think we have to remind ourselves that COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 also is about what type of society do we want. With Black Lives Matter uh, having a major impact around the world and also in the UK, it's raised a national debate about issues around race equality in Britain not just for the NHS and for the um, for public services, even for your organisation. What type of what type of organisation do you want to have in terms of inclusivity, in terms of, you know, how many senior BME partners do you have globally? I mean, and in the UK, uh, you know, at, and at all the management level. These are the kind of questions which now people are raising about on the back of COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. How inclusive are we as a society? How can we talk about issues around race? Um, as, the, as your outgoing co-chair just said, it's always down to us people of colour having to talk about it all the time. What does allyship mean for you guys? What does white privilege mean for you guys? We haven't got all the answers, but you may have some of the answers and we should be working together to explore that. Um, with the lockdown now easing, and are sort of looking more into the future. Um, what can um, Black and Asian community? How can Black and Asian communities prepare for the? Do we just need to prepare for a second wave, or what's the next step? Let Let's start off with you, Patrick. I think people are already preparing already. I mean, you know, uh, in well, on a certain level, you know. So I, I've seen the most creative and diverse um, face masks. Around protect themselves. Seriously, I, some friends of mine some made some made some wicked Kent cloth ones. Um, great opportunity for social enterprise. Uh, but no, but on a serious note, um, obviously we know it's going to happen in the winter. Uh, the virus loves the cold. We know that. Uh, so it's about not it's, not. it's not so much about. Yeah, obviously individually we have to take responsibility. Um, but I think it's the role. What's the, going to be the role of? the NHS in partnership with local government and other agencies to make sure that we've got the type of preparedness, which normally happens every winter around winter pressures, around, you know, uh, but with the added factor of COVID-19, I think this is really, really critical. Uh, so there's stuff we can do individually, personally, but but um, the sad reality is the government still hasn't got a strategy or a plan how they're going to protect people of colour who are working on the front line, who are paying their taxes uh, and contributing to society, we've just been left behind. We just, it just, you know, the government needs to step up big time on this. Uh, you know, and there are people willing to work with the government, but um, but the government needs to be open uh, and, and engaging. Um, and are they, um, how do you think the government can better protect the black and Asian community? And we, of course, don't have a vaccine yet. So do you see any temporary solutions of how to protect the communities? 
Yeah, and um, you know, to be fair, I, 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 I think some of that is coming on board, although it's been slow. And you know, this is why diversity of representation matters rather than diversity of thoughts. Because take, for example, um, some of the guidelines, some of the um, you know uh, marketing materials have been in you know languages and or mediums that don't always work for you know Black and Asian ethnic minorities. So, for example, uh, we are now seeing a few more translations. We are now seeing a few more, uh, you know, targeted ad campaigns, etc. Um, and yeah, you know, I think there's also a role for more uh, localized um, approaches, as you know, we would have heard from the leaders in Leicester, where actually there's a contingent there that you know don't receive their media or don't receive their comms in um, traditional formats, and so if the local leaders there were in a position of power and influence to be able to kind of address the, those concerns, they could have perhaps done the translation. Um, I think we are seeing more clinical risk assessments being done on the front line, but you've got to remember that at the end of the day, this is a, you know, just, just take an example of a, a Filipino nurse on a visa here who uh, he or she, you know, um, perhaps there, there is a strong power imbalance where the employer knows that they are more likely to take on uh you know shifts because they have to work to maintain that visa um and so there is some you know education and empowerment that needs to happen there is some kind of power imbalances that need to be addressed um and so some of that just you know you need some of the people in the room that make the decisions to be there to be able to advocate and to be able to advise on, on what works for different populations okay before we take general questions from the public and i just want to remind you that if you um a message um Jordan Fleury, he will then pass on the questions to me. Um, I just wanted to speak quickly about um with Patrick about progress. And there's a lot been a lot of frustration and there's obviously um frustration with the pace of change and how many problems persist. Um how would you reflect on your advocacy work? How would you rate the UK's progress? Uh, it's interesting because uh, how would we rate the UK's progress? Well, obviously, on one level, you know, we've probably got the best equality legislation in Europe, despite the fact that we're leaving Europe. That's my story. But every five years, the, the UN Rapporteur comes to Britain to see how effective we are around tackling race equality issues. And the last couple of report, the last last visits in the last 10, 15 years, of the UN Rapporteur, um, which hasn't looked very fantastic. There's still big issues around health inequalities and mental health, um, or the way the tribes of gypsy travel over Roma community, still in Britain, still are, still, are, still, uh, still terrible. Uh, um, but I think the big issue is that um, until we had COVID-19, race was off the agenda. People didn't want to take, the approach was often a colorblind approach in many aspects of public life and policy. You know, I mean, it took Lenny Henry to literally drag the BBC to start developing some work on equalities, uh, you know, basically. Uh, and, um, I mean, even more recently, um, the footballer, Rashford, uh, had launched his own personal campaign to do uh, food and breakfast clubs and stuff like that, which forced the government on the back foot. It often, it's, you know, sadly, my experience is, it's often interventions by individuals, whether it's celebrities, organised campaigns or activism, which reminds the government that your policies are wrong, you're not taking into account the needs of the community, and it's one of embarrassment and the degradation of shame in the media or internationally. That's what happened with the Wunder scandal. The Wunder scandal, the reason why the scandal got exposed, because it was a it was a national and international humiliation for treating people who were British in the first place, like criminals uh, and, and illegal immigrants, uh, and, and people lost their lives, their livelihoods, etc. Um, and it could happen again with COVID-19. It's happened, what's already happened with COVID-19. The government has not taken seriously the lived experiences of BME communities. Uh, and this applies across different aspects of social policy work. And so on long, uh, as long as there's injustices, myself or others, and Ade, who will be doing stuff from the inside, I'll be doing stuff on the outside, but how we lobby and influence for change, and that will still be ongoing. So I think going back to your question, 
it, yes, probably better than other parts of Europe. You know, that's about, I mean, I go to Germany ever so often, and um, uh, but we've still got a long way to go. And actually, a lot of people in Europe, people of colour in Europe, look towards Britain. You know, ironically, we look towards America for inspiration, and there's some good and there's some good inspiration there and again. Um, but, but people in Europe, mainland Europe, look at Britain. They look at the black experience in Europe, in Britain, and, and they want to be inspired. So if we can inspire people in Europe, and, and maybe we can inspire people in America, because we've got a long, we've got a long history. We've got a thousand years of civil rights history in Britain. But people don't know that. I mean, I've got a book coming out in end of September uh, with a colleague of mine, Dr. Angeline Osborne, called "The Hundred Great Black Britons: Celebrating a Thousand Years of Black Achievement." If you read the if you read the newspapers today, you wouldn't think that was black achievement. You would think that everyone's suffering in poverty and not articulating and, and doing stuff. There was a lot of innovation and creativity happening there, but not being given the recognition and the spotlight uh, as well. And I hope with the impact of COVID nineteen and Black Lives Matter, that government key institutions, including your own organisation, can highlight. Black achievement, beaming achievement, and success. Thank you. And one thing that I did want to point out is that, um, short, uh, despite all the shortcomings that you mentioned on the data for the UK, at least we have data in other countries. Um, in Germany, for instance, it's um, for historic reasons one does not collect any um, yeah. data on race. And I um, uh, and for um, an anatomical, um, I'd like to point out the recent article by Carolyn Look who writes how um, the black community in Germany is trying to be counted in the next census. So I'll yes. point that out. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna switch over to questions from the audience now. Um, let's go, go for the first question. Patrick mentioned action, um, prioritization and accountability. What action should be prioritized now? And is there anything we as Bloomberg employees can do to help? Um, let's start with Patrick and then over to Ada. Yeah, I think I've, I've kind of touched on some of that in our conversation. But in terms of what, what can Bloomberg do? You are Bloomberg, you're a very powerful institution, media institution, body and organisation. So obviously continuing these conversations for your staff is important. But, uh, and also I'm not quite, in terms of your work around philanthropy and stuff like that, to do, do more work and engage with a whole range of organisations out there in the community who are doing some fantastic stuff around tackling issues around inequalities and, and, and discrimination. Um, I think it could be really good um, um, also for how you work in the corporate world. So how do you influence your clients and partners around the issue around equality as well? So I think, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know how you, I'll be, I'm, I don't know much, but interested to find out more about how you do that or, or could you do more of that actually? I think it was. I think the question was more aimed at what we as individuals can do. Obviously, working with oh, someone like Bloomberg, but we are individual as we so as, well, as individuals. As, well, it depends. I mean, obviously, if you're a senior uh, person, a white person uh, with a lot of influence and power and connections, just engage more uh, about the lived experience of Black and Asian people. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's there's reverse mentoring. There's different me mechanisms which have been used for a number of years around that. Reading, talking, it's good. Uh, um, I'm actually developing a board game with a company called Focus Games, uh, and we're looking at the whole stuff around white privilege and cultural bias. So we are looking for some organisations to try and test this out. So if you're interested, then you know I'm very happy to explore that with you. But I think about taking responsibility. The problem as of being a people of colour, the burden's always on us. We have to make the business case every single second, every single day about our lived experiences. And it's hard work and it's tiring and people are knackered and tired. We have to shift the burden of proof so you can do that lift, heavy lifting for us. And we can have a break for a short while, at least, anyway. That sounds good. Um, Ade, um, you mentioned that um, the data is collected through the lens of those in charge of the existing structure. Um, what the new data would you like to see collected and that could help see the impact of ethnic minorities specifically? Yeah, uh, so I think there are a, a number of reconstructions for one of the better that, uh, that, that would be welcome to see. Uh, one would be the whole, you know, collection around ethnicities, and I know that's challenging in different countries, but in the UK, for example, or in England at least, 
um, you know, sometimes the level of nuance, the level of granularity doesn't extend beyond BAME. You know, one is in the, the you know, BAME ethnicity and then whites, you know, it, it, and, and othering isn't helpful. And again, that's just another expression of the, you know, kind of normalcy of, of, of whiteness and, and et cetera. So, um, because we know, for example, in some healthcare settings, actually, uh, ethnicity within BAME really matters. So, uh, you know, in some doctor groups and in, in, in some pay band levels for, for medical doctors, you know, there is a strong representation of Southeast Asian doctors, and there's a poor representation of black uh, doctors, etc. cetera. Um, you know, we, which is why the Black Lives Matter was such a focus, because actually across lots, and, and that's just one example, but across lots of different uh, subcategories and, it, you know, in particular uh, peculiarities of, of, of the black lived experience, black lives are often the worst. Um, and so, you know, there is a thing that if we get it right for black employees, for black staff members, et cetera, we get it right for all uh, ethnicities. But to answer the question, um, having more nuance and being del more deliberate about the different ethnicities, so rather than just a catch-all BAME, I think would be a strong start. For me also, there's something about, uh, which I you know said before, but the uh, representation of, or the diversity of, of, of di uh, representation in decision-making forums. So in a senior management team within any sector within the NHS or within, um, you know, Bloomberg, for example, is there some kind of catalogue or register or something that marks and shows these are the people that designed the programme, these are the people that designed the initiative, and there was BAME representation, there was BAME co op to ship or whatever, that then gave us the output of the out or the programme that we're seeing here. So, so you know, being, um, and, 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 and that speaks to the more systematic collection and observance of what people are doing, as opposed to just the kind of end outcome. That makes sense. Um, anything you see there, Patrick? Anything more you would like to add? No, no. I think I think um, lots of there have been lots of debates which I've been involved on, been interviewed by the media, and and journalists always ask me, "Oh, Patrick, um, is this now a new a, a new defining moment? Think, will things change?" Uh, you have to look at history. Um, I mean, only a few days ago. Um, ITV had a special programme looking at 20 years on since the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Has Britain changed? And in the opinion poll or surveys that they used, a lot of people, black and Asian people, still said that things have not changed fundamentally enough. And so that's the question. That is the litmus test that we have to use. And the question we need to ask ourselves, what more can we do for change? You know, I know, that's the question. And is there an intent and a real desire for change and that's a and that's a question for all of us to be quite honest uh, and how, how are we going to do that uh, it's not it's not simply enough to do a statement that we support that large latter matter or we have a bme staff network in our organization it's mu it's much more than that it's about taking that to the next level and that's what is required now um so um, both of you mentioned the public inquiry i just was curious how much faith you have in the process of the public inquiry and what do you think the characteristics of an inquiry are the characteristics of an inquiry to make it make sure it's impartial? We we'll start with you, Arden. Yeah, uh, well, I, I personally have um, quite a bit of uh, optimism and faith in the judiciary system of this country. Um, I, I think we've seen the uh, high courts. Uh, there is quite, at least in my mind, you know, clear water and a divide between. Uh, politics and uh, the judiciary system. Um, you know, I think we've seen that independence play out in some of the, you know, rulings on Brexit, for example. Uh, so in my mind, uh, yes, you know, uh, they will appoint a judge who will be independent, who will work to the letter of the law. Um, and uh, I think, you know, there is lots of evidence. And, you know, talking as an agent's employee, I, I, I think it's um, a little bit uh, you know, we, we could do a little bit better than the NHS market its own homework. And that's what we've had, actually. We've had some reviews where, you know, they've been internally kind of led, whereas if we had an independent uh, review, we have that overview, you know, strong scrutiny to look from end to end and really bring up to the fore some of the things that um, just because, you know, inherently you will miss some things if you haven't, uh, you know, if, if you mark your own work, basically. 
Patrick, um, do you have, um, you think there's the risk of review fatigue? There have been numerous excellent and detailed reviews, but action was missing. So you've had Windrush, you've had Stephen Lawrence, etc. Okay, well, the, the Windrush review, um, the government's now agreed to implement that, but that only happened because, again, myself and others were campaigning to put pressure on the government. David Lammy did a review some years ago uh, around criminal justice. Um, there are quite a few reviews which the government should be should have implemented already, to be quite honest. Um, but uh, this is uh, a public inquiry is not a review. A public inquiry is, uh, um, in terms of the context of the law and policy and the role of government, is quite serious. Uh, a government, I mean, obviously, a government doesn't need to implement or take on board recommendations of a public inquiry. Uh, and there have been examples of public inquiries where the government hasn't done that. But for, but I would say a significant number of public inquiries and the pro and the things about the process. So the one thing is the outcome, which is going to be a series of recommendations, which is laid, laid at Parliament, debated in Parliament. But the process is quite critical. Part of that process is people giving evidence, people who have lo people lost loved ones, frontline workers who have lost colleagues, uh, academics, professional bodies, a whole range of people who want to give evidence. And that process is, is, is just as important as the final outcome. And that's really important. It's about transparency. It's about accountability. And that, for, and that means that any government can't simply ignore the outcome of a public inquiry, especially of this significant magnitude around COVID-19. So it has a double function, really. It, has, it gives us a chance to not quite have a public mental health session, but almost it sounds like that we can, by airing it, if you think it will be a relief for the general public. It'd be yes. released to the general public, and also, of you know, there are lots of there are fans, there's, there's families, there's there's you know, lots of I would fam families, fast found families have lost loved ones. A number of those families want to share their experience, want to tell the public and the government and the inquiry about the either the treatment they loved one had or how they feel about it or what should happen, and the government can't ignore that. Sorry, Zoe, just just to say, there's there's there, there, there's something here for me as well about uh, the you know quantitative versus qualitative data, and that you know the Public Health uh, England uh, report and lots of what we see from scientists and clinicians, you know, it leans more towards that quantitative data set. Um, but the public inquiry, I think, as Patrick is saying, you know, allows for that qualitative data to help shape the narrative that we're seeing because that's unfortunately what a lot of the media have been able to kind of play upon which is the date the, the quantitative data but injecting some qualitative data in, 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 in injecting some other narrative i think would be a welcome relief for lots of different people okay the next question maybe for both of you are there any positives you you would see have come out of this experience should we start with patrick any possible review any positives any positives out of this whole experience of covid and um and the whole situation the whole current situation well i think what's happened what's interesting I, it might apply to your organization i sit on various committees and bodies and involved in quite a few things it's a process of decision making whereas before if, it, if i wanted to have a meeting with a senior decision maker it would take weeks and weeks and weeks and months to organize that meeting if not it happens in a matter of days because everything's done on zoom and all that kind of stuff uh, so there's been quicker decision making, which is a good thing. Uh, but at, at the same time, we have to recognise that uh, that decision making is only as good as the quality of information evidence that's presented. So there's been more quicker action on certain levels, uh, which is I think has been really important. Um, another thing is um, the role of online, the, the role of digital. We now realise that actually that we don't need to be in the office. We don't need to travel all the time to meetings. You know, um, I'm sure Bloomberg saved a lot of money in terms of uh, air miles and, and gotten, uh, people, you know, now people, I mean, perhaps, you know, I mean, that's probably not true because you've, you've probably have had this system in place for a long time. Whereas in terms of the NHS local governments, other parts of the system, they've now had that to rethink culturally about doing stuff online through working with teams. The downside with that is actually 
we are human beings. Interaction, connectivity, dialogue is more is, is more valuable than me doing it on the screen with you right now. Yeah. If we were having this That's meeting right. publicly, the, the conversation, the questions would be different. It would be a, diff, a, a, a different experience, experience of how we interact. So it's a functional conversation that we're having, great. I'm in my home, you're in your home, Adate's in his home or at work or wherever he is. Uh, but it's not the same as having that interaction, that new, the nuances, the body language, the, the energy. Uh, we're losing that as, as human beings. Um, Ade, do you have any positive takeaways from this whole situation? Uh, no, not really, unfortunately, is the uh, short answer. I mean, what Patrick says is true. I absolutely won't deny that. Um, when I'm not in the office, uh, you know, I have been spending more time at home with family, which is great. Um, however, I think history will be the biggest revealer as to whether or not there were any positive outcomes. Because whilst we've, you know, shone a light on some of the inequalities for uh, Bain colleagues, members of staff, etc., um, whether or not, and, and, and we know some of the strongest, um, I'm going to butcher the same, but something along the lines of some of the strongest rules are written in blood. You know, it unfortunately takes tragic accidents for, you know, legislation and things to be written to prevent that happening again. But, you know, whether or not um, long time, you know, uh, uh, over time, more lives would have been saved uh, because, you know, of, of the ones that have been lost. You know, you, you, you do that kind of maths. I'm, 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 I'm not so sure. And, and, you know, given as well, uh, actually, there is also another kind of uh, equilibrium balancing equation to do here, which is that there would have been lives lost naturally anyway. And then there's also obviously lives lost due to uh, coronavirus and, uh, you know, policies in place or not. Um, again, history will show uh, that to be true. But but for, for now, I'm, I'm not quite sure if there is a net positive outcome. Because we do want to end on a more positive note. Um, let's just, um, a short answer for this um, final question. Um, you've mentioned, um, Patrick, you've mentioned um, the history of Black and Asian people in the UK and the impact they've had on the UK society and the NHS. Are there any names that come to mind that of people you admire, just so that we can then send off our audience with some Go to Googling and Wikipedia reading to you. Oh, or just, uh, more importantly, reading your book. There's so many people. God, that's, that's not fair. Not fair question. Anyway, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, uh, the government announced these field emergency hospitals. They were named after Florence Nightingale. And I launched another campaign amongst, uh, well, I've got about 15,000 people signed a petition over a week that one of the hospitals should be named after Florence, um, Mary Seacole, who was also at the Crimea War at the same time as Florence Nightingale. She was a, um, a black woman, uh, came and she had the, the British Hotel on the front line in, in, in Balaclava in Turkey. And, you know, um, she, you know, she played a significant role uh, and it's only the last few years the Royal College of Nursing have recognised that she's a, she's contributed to nursing just as much as Florence Nightingale. But when the government announced these hospitals, they didn't mention her at all. Um, and so I did a campaign and I, and I know there was, there was a lot of campaigning within NHS England and Department of Health See, uh, be, also behind the scenes, which was as part of the, the public campaign I was doing. And the government did a re reluctantly agree, did agree to name the first COVID rehabilitation hospital in Surrey after Mary Seacole. So I think it would be Mary Seacole because she reflects the diversity of the NHS, but that diversity still needs to be valued and acknowledged. But there's, there's other heroes. But check out my book, 100 Great Black Britons. It'll be out in se late September. Uh, it'll yeah, be a cocktail yeah. book. So, you know, it'll be, be a nice read for everyone. Excellent. And Ade, I believe you also, do you have anyone? Yeah, um, someone, uh, I think I mentioned it, I mentioned him earlier, Lord Victor Adebowale, who um, was on the executive board for NHS England, NHS Improvement. He's now uh, the chair of um, NHS Confederation, which is one of our arms and bodies, um, you know, and, and someone who who is who is set up or helping to set up this race and health observatory. And he's done lots of amazing stuff in the background that's, you know, fighting for um, race inequalities, uh, to improve race inequalities in the NHS. Excellent. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks I very much. feel that's all okay. the time we have for now. Um, overall, I'd like to thank all of you for joining. Um, please. Um, continue the conversation. Look out for the last in the series of three, which is scheduled for August 11. On behalf of the Black professional and Pan-Asian communities here at Bloomberg, as well as diversity and inclusion, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And I hope this conversation prompted you to um, look at, to try to think more about the data that's out there question the approaches we have at times and how we collect the data and to overall um, th think more about this topic. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.